Hi, and welcome to Savvy Ladies Wednesday Wisdom. My name is Lisa Ernst. I'm the Executive Director of Savvy Ladies. Before we get started, a reminder that we'll have a few minutes at the end of the presentation for your questions. Please type your questions into the chat window. If you're listening to the presentation and have a question, you can send your question to info at SavvyLadies.org. We are so honored to have Manisha Thakur with us today. Man Manisha is a nationally recognized financial expert and the founder and CEO of Money Zen Wealth Management. She is known for making the complex simple while providing clear and concise financial advice to support your life goals. Welcome, Manisha. Thank you so much for joining Savvy Ladies today. Lisa, thank you so much for having me and welcome everyone to talk about a topic um, which uh, actually brings me extreme joy. And I am hoping by the end of this webinar will bring you extreme joy as well. And the topic is how to build a better budget. So to put this in context, why we're, why we're even talking about this B word, I wanted to just pause for a minute and talk a little bit about what do most of us want at the end of the day from all of our hard earned money. And I'm 44 years old and I have worked in financial services since um, getting out of undergrad. So over two decades now, and what I've observed across pretty much every income, demographic, ethnic, I mean, you slice and dice it anyway, lines, we all pretty much want the same three things. We're wondering, am I going to have enough money to live the financial life that, that makes my heart sing today? And at the same time, have enough money to feel financially calm and confident in the future. And also to leave a legacy for the next generations on the causes we care about, the people we care about on our collective earth. So we're all starting from this, this same place. The question is, how the heck do we get there? And this chart that you see in front of you, I love. Um, it comes from Carl Richards, who some of you may recognize. Um, he writes in the New York Times. Um, he has a new book coming out in the next six months or so called The One Page Financial Plan, which I think will be spectacular. His first book was called Behavior Gap. And what I, what I like about this chart is that so many things in finance can seem completely overwhelming. But when you step back, there are really only a handful of things that matter. And there are only a handful of things that you can control. So if you can keep your focus on that intersection, you can dramatically reduce the number of things that you have to worry about while also dramatically increasing the odds that you'll get the outcome that you want. And I love this chart because it applies to pretty much anything in life, but it's super useful when it comes to budgeting. So where to begin? I have found that the biggest reason most people struggle with answering the three big questions, how do I enjoy today, tomorrow, and leave a legacy, is that most of us have absolutely no idea what healthy spending looks like. So when it comes to eating, um, most of us have some mental perception of the food pyramid or the dinner plate. We have, we have some sense of roughly the amount of fruits and vegetables and meat and dairy and carbs that we should be taking in. And we may not always stick to it, but when we're way off, we tend to know it. But most of us were never taught this same framework around spending. And so I have found that many, many people um, struggle with budgeting simply because their, their spending is out of balance and the spending is out of balance simply because no one ever explained what healthy spending looks like. So what does it look like? Um, this pyramid in front of you um, is one of my all-time favorite personal finance tools. Um, I 
learned about this when reading Elizabeth Warren, um, now Senator Elizabeth Warren's book that she wrote with her daughter Amelia a couple decades ago called All Your Worth. And it was a book that stemmed from her experiences as a bankruptcy lawyer, excuse me, a bankruptcy professor at Harvard Law School and looking at what pushed families over the edge and, and what didn't. And one of the conclusions she came to was the families that that so that that thrived were engaging in healthy spending, which she defined as um, if you take all you know your income and after Uncle Sam takes out its chunk with the money that's left over, fifty percent of your money going towards your needs, thirty percent of your money going towards wants, and twenty percent going towards savings. So let me define those categories a little bit. Um, needs includes housing, transportation, food, insurance, mandatory child care, the absolute essential stuff that you have to have. Wants are all the things that bring you joy. And savings, when her book was originally written, was kind of before the student loan crisis really started to rear its head. And so in many cases, 20% savings was possible. Today, I found so many people are struggling with student loan debt and, and other forms of debt that I have um, softened a bit to include in that savings. Um, anything that you're using to pay down student loans with um, or credit card debt because you're saving the interest that you would have otherwise been, been paying. And generally speaking, when people take a look at their spending using this framework, they'll find that they're way out of whack in one or two areas. And that's why they're having trouble saving. And when it comes to need, sometimes people will say like, well, you know, like I don't really, and I, I, I don't. but I, I want it. Does it fall into needs or wants? I find it helpful just to basically say we all need housing, transportation, food, insurance. And if we have kids, we may need child care. And so um, I put all the expenses associated with those, um, even the bells and whistles into the needs. And if your needs end up being 60%, then what that tells you is you either have to trim back on wants or you're putting yourself in a red zone when it comes to having enough funds to pay off debt and save for the future. So 50, 30, 20 is, uh, to me, if you take one thing away from today's talk, that that is a great rule of thumb just to start and get a sense of, are you spending in a healthy manner or not? Um, for those of you on the East Coast or the West Coast, I frequently find that because the cost of housing is so um, enormous, that that needs ends up bumping up towards 60, 65 percent. And what I want you to realize is the pie is still 100 percent. And so really, your only option is to negotiate on on the other pieces. And um, I wish I could give you a magical formula to to make the pie add up to more than 100. But other than growing the pie larger so that your portion of that pie is more in dollars, at the end of the day, we all have that same pie to split up. So um, let me just say a few more things while we're on this chart. Most people, when they do this exercise for the first time, are like, oh, Manisha, like, I am I am off the chart. I'm seeing a lot of places where I'm nowhere near these 50, 30, 20 numbers. And so I think the first thing is to be easy with yourself and know that there are three key dynamics going on here. One, I mentioned before, we weren't taught this. Most of us weren't taught personal finance in any formal way. Two, we are bombed bombarded these days by crazy unrealistic media images. So, you know, you pick your um, pick your TV show of choice, 
um, any medical, legal, police drama, um, you'll see that every staff assistant, policewoman, nurse is showing up for her shift at 7 a.m. and has clearly had a full mani-pedi and a fresh blowout. And so we're getting bombarded with these images of, quote, average lives. But if you actually added up the cost to groom to the level that we see portrayed in TV and, and, and film as average, I have a strong hunch you would need to earn about 20% more than most of those positions pay. And lo and behold, that's roughly about how much we want to target for savings. And so if you're wondering where that money is going to come from, part of it is critically looking at media images and, and really trying to step away from the funny mirror and look at spending um, in the context of what brings you joy. Um, and then the last piece around um, why so many people look at this pyramid and feel overwhelmed when they compare it to their own finances is that over the last 30, 40 years, the financial services industry has become geometrically more complex. And so there's so many choices. I mean, it used to be if you were going to buy a car, you paid cash. And if you needed a loan, you put 20% down and you only had one choice, a five-year loan. Or if you're going to buy a home, you put 20% down and your choices were 15-year fixed or a 30-year 30 30 fixed. Now there are so many more options and choices, and yet we don't understand how to analyze the nuances, so it's easy to get tripped up. So... Bottom line, 50, 30, 20 is one of the most powerful rules of thumb that you can use to try and see, um, to, to, to try and move yourself towards healthy spending. And if when you first take this assessment, you like the vast majority of people I meet find that you're well off these numbers, just be gentle. You weren't taught about this likely. You're constantly bombarded with media images and the landscape has gotten really complex. So what to do the first thing and i'm going to start with savings because i feel like at the end of the day if you're spending in a healthy manner by definition that means that you have something left over to save and in general the 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 concept behind budgeting um is to take the funds that you have and squeeze the most amount of joy out of them. That's what I would argue that the, the, the concept is. So let me walk you through some of the three uh, most common myths that I hear from people around, around this topic. And the first one is that I can only save a little bit right now, so it's not worth it. And I always say, I mean, like, if you only have a couple minutes to talk to a girlfriend, would you say like, well, I only have five minutes, so it's not worth talking to you. No, you would, you would talk for what you have time to talk for because friendship is priceless. And it's the same thing with savings. I mean, literally, if you have five or 10 or $25 to save a month, that's what you have to save a month right now. That's great. Any amount is is worth it. So there's no dollar amount at which is too little to start saving. The second myth is that I hear a lot is that I'll start saving more when I start making more money. And what I find happens instead is something called lifestyle creep. If you don't just commit to saving right now at whatever income level you are at, what happens is once you start making more, like this this human phenomenon lifestyle creep kicks in and it's sort of like this you you get a raise and then you think wow at this raise i should have a fancier outfit so you go buy a fancier outfit and you come home and you're like man i can't be driving this car without outfit so i need a new car then you get home and you're like i can't live in this building driving this car and in this outfit i need a bigger uh, a bit a bigger better place to live and, and it's like one thing leads to another leads to another and so I find that with almost any habit and, and savings um, is, a, is a habit and a mindset that it's best to just put a stake in the ground um, and start wherever you are. And then the final point um, 
on, oops, let me go back here. The final point that I wanted to um, highlight on common myths is, has disappeared from my chart. So I will just tell you what it is. Um, it's that uh, saving is about deprivation. And that's really after the 50, 30, 20 rule, the major myth that I wanted to, to bust. There's a book that has dramatically influenced my life written in the early 1990s called Your Money or Your Life by Vicki Robin and Joe Dominguez. And in it, they present this concept that I think is so beautiful. They say, you know, most of us, we earn our money because we work. So we're exchanging our time, our life's energy at work in exchange for money. So when we're spending money, what we're really doing is spending our life's energy. And so why wouldn't we wanna honor that and make sure our life's energy is going towards the places that bring us the most amount of joy? And so to me, the whole art of budgeting is the art of allocating our life's energy, the money that we have received in exchange for our hard work towards the things in life that make us smile. And so I have found that one of the single best ways to start off budgeting is in a joy-based manner. So what you do is you, you write down for as long as you can tolerate it. Start with a week. If if you can do a month, that's optimal. And if you can do three months, that's like gold standard. And you literally just carry around a little book or you can do it on an, on your iPhone. Um, and you highlight, you, you just jot down every single thing you spend money on. You're at the grocery store, the drugstore register, and you pay the bill. You just write, you know, CVS or Dwayne Reed and the, the dollar amount. You don't have to get super specific with it. Um, and at the end of the week or the month, sit down and highlight anything that you spent money on that list that did not make you happy. Fifty, thirty, twenty 20 numbers are off because that's something that you can cut out of your life and not reduce any joy because it wasn't making you happy to begin with. So, I mean, just to give some examples, you know, d expensive dinner or cocktails out with a group of people that you didn't even enjoy being with, food you bought that made you fat, um, things that, uh, you know, you, you're paying, like the classic example, right? You're paying for the, the 500 package cable TV thing and you realize that you watch everything on your computer. So you'll find places and, and, the other part of the exercise is it really starts to retrain your brain to thinking about um, to shifting from budgeting and feeling like you're depriving yourself and you're in a straitjacket to a completely different place where you're thinking about you have this pile of life's energy, the, these funds that um, you've worked hard for, and now you're on this quest to figure out how best to allocate them so that you can be happy today, feel secure tomorrow, and, and leave a legacy for the people or the causes that, that you believe in. And so it turns into a joy optimization exercise as opposed to one of constraint or deprivation. So why am I harping so much about, about savings? Most of us know how to spend to bring ourselves joy today. Um, and what, what we're trying to do is strip out any spending in the today category that isn't bringing us joy so that we have room for those other two buckets, the safety and security in the future and that ability to, to, to give um, and contribute to others. And one of the reasons that um, saving is so powerful and starting right now is so powerful is the impact of time. So I'll give you an example with some ages, but this, these work, you can shift the, the ages up by 20 years and it's the same math. So um, if we take a look at Jane and Jane at 
age 25, comes across savvy ladies and is totally committed to um, spending in a healthy manner and optimizing your joy. So she makes a tough decision to start saving $5,000 a year every year. And it's not easy. It means that she, she has to tell friends, that's not in my budget. Why don't you come over to my place and we'll do a potluck? Or why don't we rent a movie? Going out to a movie isn't in my budget right now. And so she lives a little differently than her friends, but she also really inspires them by pointing out these tough trade-offs. She gets an average return of 7% um, in a mix of low-cost stock and bond index funds. And at age 65, Jane's got a million dollars. Then let's take a look at Joe. So let's say Joe um, was not smart enough to know about savvy ladies and didn't pay any attention to his personal finances. And he waited until age 45 to start thinking about this topic at all. So he starts saving $5,000 a year at age 45. He gets the same 7% return as Jane, but at age 65, he only has $200,000. So that 20 year head start gave Jane five times more money than Joe. And so if you're looking at this and you're 45, around my age, and you're just getting started, not to worry. That is way better than if you're 65 and you're looking at this and you're just getting started. So the thing I want you to know is, is time is like this magic ingredient. And I, I use the analogy of sunscreen. It's like people who use sunscreen in their 20s and 30s don't look that different than people who don't use sunscreen in their 20s and 30s. But by the time you get in your 40s and 50s, you can see who was using their sunscreen and who wasn't using sunscreen. And the kind of things you have to do to your face to make it look like you use sunscreen start to be really difficult and expensive. And it's the same thing with savings. If you just start saving a little bit early on, it won't feel like a whole lot is happening. But the magic of time over a 20 plus year period, you will be blown away at what happens when you combine savings and investing in, in low cost um, index, uh, like mutual funds. So that's why it's, it's so important. Um, the other reason it's so important is, um, that not only is time important in savings, but we've had a major, major shift and we're the first generation to experience it outright in the role of retirement in our lives. So, you know, 50, 60 years ago, when Social Security first came around, you got Social Security at age 65, but the average person died at 63. So it, it, it was meant to be this kind of stopgap measure. And people who you, so because of life expectancies, people tended to work and retire. And a couple of years later, they'd pass on. Today, it's a sea change with longer lifespans and extra so for us women who live longer than men, statistically in aggregate. Let's say you have a normal working career of 30 to 40 years. You could literally live in retirement. And, you know, let's say you retire at 65, 70, you could live in retirement for 30 years. So for every year you've worked, you not only had to have funded that year of living expenses, but you would have also had to have set aside enough money to fund you know, up to a year of retirement savings in, in the future. So this is why it's so important to get started. And the chart in front of you comes from Fidelity and it's just a rough guideline. If you are below these targets right now, this is a sign that you really wanna uh, dig into your um, spending and see if you can um, find a more optimized way to squeeze out a little more savings. And the way you use this chart is, let's say you make um, $50,000 a year. Um, if you're 30 years old right now, ideally you'd have saved in your retirement accounts $25,000. Um, if you're 40, um, and you're making $50,000 a year, the way you look at this chart is ideally you'd want savings that is at least two times your income level to be on track. So you'd, you'd want to have $100,000 in, in savings set aside. And the vast majority of people who look at this chart gasp and they're like, oh my, I am totally behind the eight ball. 
So if, th if that's what you're feeling, you are not alone and it's not too late. It's amazing the combination of saving a little more aggressively and working a couple more years um, on the other end um, can make to these numbers. So last but least, I just want to talk about um, how to, to track this stuff um, logistically in your life. There are a variety of different ways. If you are, um, if you feel very comfortable with online solutions, you can use something like a mint.com where you are loading up all of your financial information so that you can um, get it all on one nice screen with, with charts and other analyses. Um, there are companies like American Express that have um, prepaid cards where you could literally put your spending for the month on this prepaid card. And then when you log in, you can literally see every single item you spent money on because you put all that money on that, that card. And um, unlike a credit card, you can't spend what's not on that card. So that's another easy way to track. Um, if you have a debit card, many banks um, have budgeting software or you can literally just keep your monthly running log, take a look um, at if you put everything on your debit card of exactly what went out. Or you can literally be as simple as put a little booklet or a piece of paper in your purse or your wallet and write things down there. So when in doubt, go simple. There's, there's zero reason why you need to start with some fancy schmancy system to do this. Your, your goal here is to switch your thinking from deprivation and um, constraint around budgeting to joy optimization and knowing that you worked hard for that money, you exchanged your life's energy for it. And what you're doing now and going forward is really making sure that you're squeezing out the most amount of joy that you possibly can um, from each one of those dollars. So that's those are some thoughts on how to build um, a better budget. And if you'd like to connect with me, I'm on all the usual suspects social media wise. Um, my website's Money Zen, and I do put out a monthly newsletter where I month, um, sort of a curated uh, quick list that you can go to each month and um, spend a little bit of time and, and get yourself uh, financially empowered. And with that, let me stop and see if there are any questions. Thanks, Manisha. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, we had a couple questions that came in over email. So um, can you hear me, Manisha? I can, yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, what can you do and what's your suggestion if you haven't met the savings target for your age? So my suggestion is to go into um, complete closet cleaning mode. And by this, I mean, I, I quite literally just did this. I cleaned out my closet. I'm giving away 11 bags of stuff. And I feel like I have more clothes in my closet than I ever have had in my life, even though I have so much less. And it's the process of applying that to everything in your life. So if you're behind on those numbers, you have only two levers to, to make that move, earn more or spend less. And so if you can approach, um, if you can approach the exercise as going through the various different elements of your life and try to see where you can pare back spending or sell things or shed things, Many, many women tell me that that process frees them up. And it's like this bizarre serendipitous kind of experience where while they're, you know, selling things on eBay or um, getting rid of stuff, that new opportunities to earn more money come in. And I, um, I'm speaking to you from Santa Fe, and we tend to be a little bit woo-woo out here in Santa Fe. But it is the darndest thing. I have seen this across the country that the space opens up once you start focusing on it. So point number one is you've got to spend less and, and earn more. 
Those are your options immediately. And you can earn more through taking on odd jobs on the weekend and something that might be fun um, and um, committing that money to um, your savings. You can earn money by selling some of your stuff. You can, um, you can um, uh, uh, spend less through some of the, the methods that we talked. And I definitely recommend reading the book, um, Your Money or Your Life. Most people look at that chart and they are behind. And the key I found to catching up, it's really a mindset shift. Um, and the other book that I'll, I'll recommend is one that I co-wrote with Sharon Kadar, and it's called On My Own Two Feet. Um, the subtitle is A Modern Girl's Guide to Personal Finance. And I think between that book and Your Money or Your Life, you'll get a real perception shift that will help you make the tough choices that are involved in spending less and earning more. And you will be amazed. It's just like dieting. If you just exercise or you just eat better. And then if you do both, how the results are geometrically more effective, the same thing happens here. If you can incrementally spend a little less incrementally earn a little more, you will be amazed that the effect is not linear is geometric. Great. Manisha, uh, you've heard this term living paycheck to paycheck. So would you say that that doesn't really exist, that concept? It, uh, it, no, I would say it totally exists. Studies say that roughly 70% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. It is the predominant way of living today. And I think there are a, a number of different factors that come into this. Certainly, we have income disparity. Certainly women, we have issues in the sense that collectively we're earning 77, 78% cents on the male dollar. There are certain professions that from a moral and ethical standpoint, like teachers and nurses, which my mom and my aunt are respectively, you, I look at their, their salaries and I think about how much they're contributing to the world. And, and I'm horrified at the disparity. So there are a lot of big picture reasons why, but most people are living paycheck to paycheck because we don't know what healthy spending looks like. We judge what seems fair and reasonable by looking at our neighbors, but they don't know what it looks like either. And so the vast majority of us are living paycheck to paycheck because we're spending either too much on needs or too much on wants. And we're living a life that's larger than what our paycheck mathematically affords. Um, not because we're bad people, we just didn't know what we were supposed to be aiming for. So if you were living paycheck to paycheck and your um, cable bill was $140, like that's an, a suggestion that you would look at and say, how important is cable TV? And then exactly pay yourself back $140 a month because you really don't need cable TV. Exactly. Can you not consolidate everything so that you're, you're getting all your entertainment, you pay to have internet instead, and you get, you just choose to entertain yourself by, you know, Netflix or or some lower cost solution that you can do online without having a separate um, bill. And it's literally looking item by item at, at things like this. And for all the moms on the phone, I, I wanted to also just say, there's been um, uh, inf inflation in the cost of raising children in the sense that I like, it's amazing what kids feel they not just want, but absolutely positively have to have. And so I want to encourage moms that, you know, no is a complete sentence um, when it comes to your kids if, and, and you're teaching them such a good lesson by letting them know um, what is reasonable and what's not reasonable within your household budget. And moms tell me across the country how so often the area they find in all this is not that they're spending on themselves, um, it, it's spending on kids. And sometimes it's in the hardest. I was just talking to somebody the other day who's sending um, kids to private school, um, two kids to private school on one income. Um, and there's just not enough income for those kids to go to private school. And so the answer was this person is going to move back in with their parents for a while and the kids are going to go to a great school district near their parents. It's not fun to be in your mid thirties, moving back in with your parents, 
but taking a couple of years to really get back on firm financial footing. So sometimes the answers are a little bit extreme, um, but um, all of the things we talked about here, I think can help you find a starting point. And it's really a mindset shift I've, I've found. I just want to thank you again, because this has really been a terrific um, 40 minutes. And I want to thank everybody for coming today and the, the questions we were asked. And we look forward to seeing you in the future um, at other Savvy Ladies webinars. Thanks, Manisha. Happy holidays, everybody.